So, welcome everybody to our conference. It's uh, great to see you all in our aula of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. And uh, some of you are known to me, and it's so good to see you all. Dear Lena Nemirovskaya, Moscow School of Civic Education. Yura Zenokosov, Moscow School of Civic Education. Lord Skidelsky Robert, where is Lord Robert? Ah, okay, fine. To see a real lord here, this is something very important. Uh, House of Lords, British Parliament. Turnbock Jakland, I met Mr. Jakland. Ah, he will, ah, okay, he will, will be in another way be present. Secretary General of the Council of Europe, uh, Herr Botschafter Rüdiger von Fritsch, former no, Ambassador of Germany to the Russian Federation, will come later, I am informed. Uh, and then Alvaro Gil Robles, former Commissioner for Human Rights of the Council of Europe. Alvaro Gil Robles, where is Alvaro Gil? Uh, Alvaro will come tomorrow. He will come tomorrow, okay. So, uh, I mentioned all the names which were proposed uh, to me to, to mention. And certainly I should mention all of you because you're all very important uh, personalities and not because only of your importance but as personalities. And I'm very happy to see Professor Mikhailov. We just met uh, last week in Vilnius. It was a very special occasion and I thank you very much, uh, President Mikhailov, for uh, what has happened in the uh, Humanities University in Vilnius. Ladies and gentlemen, Konrad Adenauer once said, and I quote, democracy is more than a parliamentarian form of government. It is a world outlook that is based on every person's perception of dignity, values, and inalienable rights. Democracy has to respect these inalienable rights and values of every individual in economic and cultural life. So far, the quote. Values must be internalized and filled with life or else they will fade away. Democracy has to be constantly learned and practiced to prevent it from failing. Our commitment to stand up and work for our values and democracy unites the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung with you, our partners, whom I have the pleasure of welcoming here today. A warm welcome at the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung to all of you. Also, let me congratulate the Moscow School of Civic Education, represented by you, dear Lena Nemirovskaya, on the 25th anniversary of your institution. It's like the European Humanities University. It's 25 years old as well. It gives me great pleasure to congratulate you on this wonderful anniversary. 25 years is a wonderful age, but it will continue. <laughs> You, the uh, Moscow School of Civic Education, the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, and all our partner, other partners wish to persuade young people to become enthusiastic about democracy. We want to encourage them to commit themselves to their country and their society. We want to empower them to take an active part in shaping the future as Democrats. Civic education is the core of our work. We Germans have been seriously alerted to the necessity of this work just recently again. After winning seats in several state parliaments, the so-called Alternative für Deutschland, Alternative for Germany, is now even represented in the federal parliament, the Deutsche Bundestag. It is a party that opts for populism and demagogy, demagogy deliberately used fake news and stirs up fears to exploit them for its purposes. The people, us, sincere Democrats, have to put a stop to these trends. We know our values, combined with civic education, are the key to achieve this. Not only Germany is facing such challenges. In many countries of Europe and Western Hemisphere, populist, nationalist, or even fascist parties and movements have gained ground. Nations tend to become increasingly self-centered again, even some member states of the European Union. Home, region, home country, Europe, these are levels of belonging that together, intrinsically, those who care only for their home region will not protect it. Those, on the other hand, who see themselves exclusively as Europeans 
have no roots, and those who place their own nation above the others, those who start out as patriots and end up by isolating themselves from others, will become nationalists, and nationalism will lead to war. This is the historic experience. Fortunately enough, there were courageous and visionary men and women after World War I and World War II who were adamant that things like that must never happen again. This is how universal values and human rights were laid down in the UN Charter, being recognized throughout the world. Today, we see our values being increasingly questioned and challenged. Some people deny them entirely. Others want them to be understood differently. Against this background, our conference will address no less an important question than how to make these universal values strong again. In pursuing this aim, the Moscow School of Civic Education is a wonderful partner which, sadly enough, is forced to work under more and more difficult conditions in his own home country, in its home country today. Dear Elena Nemirovskaya, you will certainly enlighten us about the adversities and obstacles you have to cope with in carrying out your work. Therefore, we are delighted to host this conference at the Konrad Adenauer Foundation this time after we cooperated as partners last year. Let me welcome you warmly once more again at our academy, as I also welcome our other partners, the Council of Europe, the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, the Finnish Permanent representation to the Council of Europe as well as the Robert Bosch Stiftung, the host of last year's event. And I want to thank uh, uh, Mrs. Crawford, our former federal minister. Where is she? Ah, she's sitting here. I should think, yeah, I did not see. I always, uh, and this is a political vision, I always look to the center, you know, and not so much to the left and not so much uh, uh, to the right. So I want to thank Claudia Crawford West as well for her great contribution she is doing for our work uh, in Moscow, in Russia. And uh, it's always nice to see you, and it's very nice seeing all of you, ladies and gentlemen. We as Europeans uh, share values, and if you permit uh, me to allow uh, to say that I had the honor as president of the European Parliament to sign the, uh, I think it was the 12th of December 2007, the Charter of Fundamental Rights uh, of the European Union together with the then uh, president of the European Council, the Prime Minister of uh, Portugal, Socrates, and the president of the European Commission, uh, Jose Manuel Durao Barroso, and in this Charter of Fundamental Rights, we describe all the values which we share, whether we are members of the European Union or not, and it's my deep wish that these values finally will be the values and in practice as well, not only in the countries of the European Union, but everywhere in Europe and in the world. Thank you so much, and once again, welcome to the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. Let me first thank all of you for the opportunity to be here in Berlin. Uh, we thought uh, that we would have uh, we have a mountain to overcome to have this forum, but we have succeeded, and we have succeeded thanks uh, to the mm, great friends. Uh, and uh, in many ways uh, we had to face uh, constraints and I thank all of you who have uh, found it possible to make their way to this uh, forum. Let me thank uh, um, the foundation of Konrad Adenauer uh, for this beautiful opportunity to have convened. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you um, uh, very much uh, for uh, being here and uh, for for being uh, uh, for being um, mm, uh, here and uh, in the wake uh, of uh, the great celebration we had in Vilnius uh, for the European Humanitarian University, which uh, 
not unlike our school, uh, has uh, found its way uh, in in Vilnius uh, uh, instead of Minsk, and we are here in Berlin instead of Moscow. But uh, we are practicing uh, our activities uh, across uh, Europe and. Uh, in the United States, uh, in the Caucasus, in the Balkans. Uh, thank you, Sonia, for being with us. Uh, and it is said, uh, um, one has to uh, to confess, uh, but uh, uh, it is uh, at the same time uh, a joy that we may continue, that we do continue uh, in the candid hope uh, that uh, we uh, will uh, prevail. We believe that this is important not just for my country, but for the countries across the world as we're facing challenges uh, which are uh, quite uh, similar. Thank you, Claudia, um, sincerely for the great uh, enthusiasm in uh, uh, making the Moscow School a partner to Konrad Adenauer Foundation. Uh, I will not uh, exploit your uh, attention, but uh, let me try uh, in this short deliberation uh, try to answer the question as of, of why we're here. And uh, I think that the answer um, we have uh, throughout these 25 uh, um, years. Uh, have gone over 25,000 alumni, the people who have gone through this school. And uh, Alexander Sogomonov uh, uh, has been uh, with us uh, from the first uh, days. I'm happy to see you here. We have always uh, sought uh, to um, seek uh, young uh, regional uh, leaders, uh, politicians, administrators. We believe that if we can share the European experience, if we can share the um, American uh, uh, democratic experience and uh, the experience of, uh, of the European democracies, we can make uh, the Russian uh, bureaucracy uh, more uh, swift uh, and uh, Pro reform. However, the conditions um, have turned um, differently, and uh, we have to state uh, that out of the generation of our alumni, uh, have had uh, the choice between the words of career and the uh, exigencies of career and the values, and many have chosen the career. Um, it may be that some of them will uh, go back to their reminiscence of the school of many years ago, and they may go back uh, to some thoughts as to to what we uh, spoke about uh, in dignity. Uh, one may do many things in life, uh, but I think that uh, uh, disparaging uh, the dignity, dignity uh, is uh, uh, is uh, uh, forbidden. We are here because uh, we value freedom. And we realize uh, that uh, every person has as much freedom as we can pay for it personally, without uh, trying uh, to l impose uh, this responsibility upon others. We are those who prefer democracy to the oppressive uh, 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 bureaucracy and uh, red tape. We are those uh, who trust uh, that reforms uh, can be implemented without violence and police uh, control. And we're here because we're 25. We are 25 and 25 years ago, when creating this school, we went uh, through the time of uh, levitation, uh, and uh, we hardly knew that uh, uh, we uh, would uh, never wish to part with the freedom uh, we fought and won. At that time, we understood that freedom requires from us uh, a civilized uh, approach, uh, uh, a competence uh, in uh, social and uh, 
judicial affairs. And indeed, we wanted to impart this knowledge, or at least what we thought to be our knowledge, uh, to many of, of the Russians uh, uh, and uh, uh, people from other countries. The creed of civic enlightenment has been with us uh, for this uh, quarter of a century. And we're trying to make this uh, uh, motto uh, to be a little more specific, while we understand that crisis is not just about Russia, crisis is uh, mm, about uh, uh, even the countries and the places uh, which uh, we uh, um, believe to be mature democracies. We understand that the challenges uh, are faced uh, in different parts of the world. So uh, we are saying today that yes, we're all different, but we're all citizens. What is it that we mean when we say that we're all citizens? Uh, the seminars of this school have been uh, dedicated to this topic. It is common knowledge that the ideas of democracy seem to be more desirable when they have to be fought for than when they are already granted and acquired. The champions of democracy of yesterday are often unaware as to where they should uh, proceed and the majority of people have uh, discovered uh, that uh, the change in their lives uh, to the better is far to be desired. These, these problems related to democracy are characteristics not just for the post-communist countries. The interest towards uh, democracy is fading and we are here because we understand that that the depolitization or the waning of the political uh, sentiment in the democratic societies and the propaganda induced politization in the authoritarian regimes uh, has uh, reached dangerous levels. Today, I think that in spite of, uh, uh, of uh, um, the challenges we have uh, to persist in talking about the values, because uh, it is uh, thanks uh, to them uh, that we can try and create uh, a common humanitarian space. We know that this crisis uh, is of a global nature. It is a political and economic um, uh, tendency. It is a crisis, crisis in decision-making. It is a crisis of rational approaches. It is a crisis of trust or rather a crisis uh, uh, of trust uh, waning. And as we speak about these problems, it appears to me that it is important uh, to find a, a certain point uh, of uh, analysis, a point where we may stop in our tracks and uh, look around and look for those universal human values which uh, uh, make us human. It is uh, the conscience, the dignity, the moral act, an active civic stance, a duty of a citizen before his or her society. In the Soviet times, and even later, for uh, generations went through schools and uh, had uh, the lofty examples of the classical literature before us. And we tried to follow these uh, 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 examples in our uh, lives, which of course is very far from, from being ideal, as there are no ideal people, as there are no ideal democracies. But what we have uh, tried and uh, hoped to uh, go for as, an, uh, as a, a, a victory or a loss, uh, uh, as this black and white psychology, is uh, indeed something that uh, may give rise to nihilism. And it is uh, when uh, such uh, lofty examples uh, 
may unfortunately uh, lead to uh, a loss in uh, uh, humanity. And indeed, uh, many of us simply did not notice that we lived and continued to live in a country of, uh, of uh, uh, wickedness. This is one of the said uh, statements that we confront even today, specifically in the past years, when uh, quite uh, devoid of uh, illusion, uh, we are seeing what has been happening in uh, my country over the past three to four years. Let me just uh, make uh, another proposition which the school has always uh, given much importance to. We live in a world but through us the world grows itself while we create some, some, something in this world, while we foster the work of morality, while we perform the moral acts, the world stays with us. And once we leave the space or leave the stage, the world starts to descend into obscurity. Not because we're so much important as individuals, and we're not, but because it is the world which uh, uh, rests uh, on uh, uh, a series and myriads of individual acts. A civic society is not uh, what uh, we can touch uh, or see as a tangible uh, thing. Civil society is about like outbursts that happen by us, through us, through our civic attitude through our dignity something bigger coming through us and that is why it seems to us it's better to not just speak about civil society per se but about society of citizens this is where you hear res human soul resonating this is where something good for society is born an ability to see the other Today we are here in the heart of Europe, we are in Germany. Germany is when, for my generation, is one of the important countries, Jutta, these words are for you, because I saw the example of my dear friend, what it meant for her to survive the humiliation after the defeat of the country and how through these great thinkers and come from all the countries, I mean Habermas and Dahrendorf that I'm referring to first and foremost, how to get out of this historic non-existence and how to make this country one of the important countries in European of the European dream of the European dream of a, the European home, this very project Europe. And today, now that we all perfectly know that this is the crisis that is on us, and that everybody feels the tension, especially here in Germany. It is the crisis, the political crisis, that the country is living through. I believe and I want to believe in Germany remaining the pivotal country that would support the great values which Europe has recreated in the times of the Enlightenment. And just the final remark I wish to make. 
I want to once again thank all the foundations and organizations that for 25 years have been supporting this school. First and foremost, the Council of Europe, and first and foremost, Madame Catherine Lalumiere, Secretary General of the Council of Europe, who in the early 1990s thought it possible and feasible to confide and to in people who just came to her office, well, literally from the street. And uh, that was a very different time we lived in. Maybe that was the time that was the time of illusions. But Jack, uh, who is also present here in this room, what I want to say, for all these years, we in this school wanted to live up to that confidence and that trust that you put in us 27 years ago, as you just considered our papers, our ideas that we came up to you for the Council of Europe at the time where Russia was not the member at the time of the Council of Europe. I would also like to express my special gratitude to the team where I have, with whom I have worked for this 25 years. We have seen people coming and going to this team. Today it is very much unlike what it was like 25 years ago. But we started all that together. We have here with us Sasha Sugomonov, who inspired this project, Andrei Alexandrovich, who was, uh, belonged to the first class, and now he is a prominent researcher who is very welcome at every international site. We have here with us Simeon Ginsburg, also an alumnus from Kaliningrad. Thank you so much. Many of people are, should have been here but are not here with us today, and I would like to once again say a few words about the team I, I'm working with now. They're all very young people. For the most part, they, they, are, they graduated from their school. They all traveled from Russian regions. What I want to say that the joy and the pleasure of working with these people with a personal creative approach, with a personal integrity, and their personal commitment and involvement, it gives me such pleasure. And when, at times, we do not see each other for a while, we miss each other and one another. And that's why, first and foremost, I miss them all. And finally, as we started the school 25 years ago, it was inaugurated by the famous intellectuals of Europe and America, Ernest Geller, Ralph Darendorf, Francois Furet, Claude Lefort, Harold Berman, Richard Neustadt, and our Russian famous people from Russia, the people who are full of Human, I would like to say, personability. They are Yuri Levada, Alexei Salmin, have this personal charisma. They are no longer with us. And today at the school, we have a quite different pleiad of remarkable experts, as I think they are the best, as I see it. Best of them, of all we know, or we try to get to know them again. And I'm, as I'm wrapping up on this very festive time, as we celebrate 25 years of the Moscow School, but the time where we are no longer cherish any illusions, and instead we are all keen to do something. And as luck has it, whether we'll see something done or 
we may not see any result. I want to utter a phrase that I read in some text that I read of a very person who's, who means a lot to me, that is Lev Gudkov. In one text he quotes Seneca, Today we have a poor harvest, but tomorrow we need to sow again. Thank you. Dear friends, I regret that I cannot be with you in person, not least because the issues that you are discussing are of great importance. Today, Europe's democratic model is under increasing strain. The challenges it faces include populism, hate speech and political extremism, and the breakdown of citizens' trust in our democratic institutions. We need to reflect on these challenges and to discuss how we should respond to them. That's why events like this one are so important. Since its foundation 25 years ago, the School of Civic Education has been proactive in promoting democratic values. It has sought to help build a modern Russian state based on the rule of law and public participation. These aims are so relevant today as they were in 1992, and civic education remains key to delivering them. I would like to express my admir admiration for Lena Nemirovskaya, her team and all that they have achieved together. Their success is reflected in the number of alumni who hold high-level positions in the cities and regions of Russia. The Moscow School was the first school of political studies and its success has been contagious. It has inspired a genuine network of schools covering the former Soviet Union, the Hovlo East and Southeastern Europe, the South Caucasus and even extending beyond Europe's border to the South Mediterranean. Nonetheless, it is clear and concerning that the Moscow School is today operating in a very challenging environment. Over the past few years, the school work has been seriously affected by the law on foreign agents. Rest assured that my support remains unfaltering, just as my predecessor, Catherine Lallermier, did so much to promote the foundation of this institution. We continue to stand shoulder to shoulder. The Council of Europe is doing its utmost to re-establish the conditions in which the school can function normally and prevent similar threats from arising in other countries. Europe needs stronger democrat democracies and healthier political culture. That requires sound legal frameworks, durable democratic institutions, and the emergence of responsible and capable leaders who are accountable to the citizens. A culture of civic education creates the conditions for this success, and I know that the Moscow School will remain a trusted partner for the Council of Europe. I wish you all the success. Thank you very much indeed. My gratitude uh, to goes to um, the Council of Europe and uh, personally to uh, Secretary General Mr. Tobian Jagland uh, for his um, support and participation. Let me give uh, the floor uh, to co-chairman um, uh, of uh, the advisory board uh, of the school, uh, the um, uh, great friend um, and unwavering supporter of uh, uh, the school, Mr. John Lloyd. First of all, before I say one or two words about the school, uh, I want to read a message from Christopher Chris Patton, who is the Chancellor of Oxford University and in various capacities, including that he has helped the school for much of the last 25 years. It's always difficult to follow Lena, though in one way or another I've followed Lena and Dura for the last 25 years with deepening admiration and affection. And that's not 
confined to me. There are many in this room and many not in this room who have done the same. But first from the Chancellor. He writes, I am sorry that I cannot be with you for this valuable alumni conference. The Moscow School of Civic Education has bravely played an important role in trying to prevent the erosion of civic values in Russia and beyond. The relationship between economic and political freedom remains vital for a peaceful and economically successful future, but it is under pressure and threat on every continent. Civic education goes well beyond teaching about the importance of casting votes. It is about the freedoms associated with pluralism and a sense of what the French might call civic solidarity, and we in Britain might refer to as generosity of spirit or open-minded clubability. The work of the school, even after 25 years, is still required. I hope that the necessity of everything which is done in such a principled and courageous way becomes less crucial over the 25 years ahead. Let me just add one or two things before we start the proceedings. As Chris Patton has said, as Lena has said, as Dr. Pertering has said, the Western world, the liberal democratic world, uh, is under great pressure from a variety of sources, and some of these sources are rather similar to the threats and pressures upon Russia in the last 25 years. And that's one of the reasons why the school is at least as important now as it has ever been. Many people in this room and elsewhere have been drawn into the school, uh, in part that is because of the magnetism of the personalities of Jura and of Lena. But it's also because they, we, uh, adhered to the values uh, which the school has promulgated for the last quarter of a century. These are values which have been referred to, the values of civic freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of publication, freedom of association, and of course, the, the rule of law. The school has in many ways, in seminars, in conferences, in publication, on the website, in personal meetings, has tirelessly promoted these for the last quarter of a century. And it has had much help, including from uh, organizations like the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Germany and many others throughout the world in Europe, in North America, and elsewhere. Uh, its survival in propagating these values remains our care and our concern, and I would argue, in some form, our necessity. So as we listen to the speakers in this special meeting, this meeting to commemorate 25 years of existence and success, existence and success, then we will hear and you should bear in mind the values which the school fights for and which, as Lena said, every individual must find in him or herself the ability and the freedom also to promulgate. Thank you. Другой наш замечательный эксперт школы и член... Our great uh, expert and uh, member uh, of the uh, advisory board uh, for uh, Ladies, gentlemen, my friends, Lena, um, I've been associated with the school for many years, um, have uh, admired it, admired what it's been trying to do and have been very privileged to be part of that. Many generations of students uh, and um, many memories 
very fond memories. But this is the end of the celebratory phase of the activity and the beginning of the serious phase. That is my speeches. Um, so um, I don't want to um, spend any more time praising what's happened, but try and put some clothes on the challenges which the previous speakers have mentioned, the challenges to uni universalism, and ask why they've come about and what can we do to meet them. Now, being an academic or a scholar, I tend to like to classify things. So I have three classifications of universalism to start with. Um, first, universalism in the natural sciences. It denotes the existence of laws valid at all times and all places. The laws of nature, we call them. The same action in the same conditions always leads to the same result. For example, the law of gravity. However, the laws of nature are not necessarily the laws of science. Nature behaves according to its laws, but the laws of science are posterior to our mental evolution as a species and are in continuous evolution. We learn to change our conceptual framework and adapt it to um, our experience. So in science, the opposite of universalism is evolution. So that's one classification. Secondly, we also apply the notion of universalism to the behavior of our own species. As in the phrase, people are much the same everywhere. This sameness may arise from a common genetic inheritance or the fact that people everywhere undergo much the same social experiences. Anyway, the principle of what I could call limited independent variety gives rise to universal patterns of behavior. And two such universal pattern traits have been singled out. Self-interest, and identification with one's group. These are the economic and the sociological explanations of human behavior. And they're said to be universal, encountered by all groups at all times. The opposite of universal in this sense is historical. History displays humans living under a great variety of conditions and developing a great variety of laws, institutions, and norms of behavior as a consequence. For example, self-interest may be natural to humans, but different societies have developed very different uh, codes of behavior in relation to self-interest. The pre-modern world discouraged the explicit expression of self-interest, but once the economists came along, they praised it as the motor of wealth creation. So um, th there, there we also, um, we have a historical var variability in a so-called universal notion. Um, but I'm not sure, it's, but I'm sure it's in the third sense that you want to discuss universalism at this symposium, and that is in the sense of universal values the values we accept as binding on us and by which we try to live our lives. The opposite to universalism in this sense is particularism, localism, even nationalism, or if we look at it dynamically, disintegration and entropy. Do universal values exist? 
Conclusive evidence of their existence is not to be found by citing documents like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. These were written by Western lawyers at a time when the West was the world's lawgiver. I doubt whether lists of values drawn up by Chinese, Indian, or African thinkers at any time would have been the same or had the word universal in them. What we here in Berlin today mean by universal values are the values of Western civilization as developed from ancient Greece, Judaic Christianity, the French Revolution, and the scientific outlook. The most important items in this galaxy um, of values are the value of the individual, respect due to that individuality, and the centrality, therefore, of individual liberty, freedom of association, and freedom under the law. These values define Western civilization. Now, the question is whether they've spread sufficiently around a world that is disintegrating politically to um, uh, achieve the status of universal values. Um, now, I think we have to recognize that though elements of this value system are to be found everywhere, elsewhere. The edifice as a whole was a unique achievement of Western civilization. Much to the sorrow of Russian liberals, Russia is only partly Western in the sense I've described. As many historians have pointed out, including Richard Pipes, who, is up, who's up, who often spoke at at, at, at this school, Russian, the Russian cultural genome, genome evolved in a peasant milieu in which property was held and life lived in common. Relationships were governed not by legal norms but by informal understandings and a clear distinction between those inside and those outside the common mentality. Traditionally, a closed society Russians, this is what Andrei Konchalovsky has written, love or hate you, but they don't respect you. Now, I mean, and that's all traced back to the, the way um, relationships developed in this kind of society. And every, that's familiar to everyone here. But more interestingly, Germany also came late to the Western Party. Running through German philosophy and literature is the distinction between culture and civilization. In a famous essay, Thomas Mann described the First World War as a war between German culture and Western civilization. Western civilization being represented by Paris, cold, logical, dead. Um, for those who think in these terms, the contrast between heat and cold, life and death, comes quite naturally. Spengler echoed a long tradition when he wrote that civilization represents the death throes of a culture. It may be that in Europe today, um, that Europe, the civilizational center of the world, is dying before our eyes. I just offer these thoughts as an introduction to the two great challenges we face today. First, the revolt against universalism in the West itself. This started as a popular uprising against a particular type of universalism, globalization, in the late 1990s, and has since morphed into populist politics of various strands. It's fueled by anger at loss of jobs, loss of identity, loss of democracy, loss of sovereignty, against all those forces of economic universalism tending towards the emasculation of the nation state and the communal loyalties that it inspires. In the name, that is a movement 
uh, of, of economic integration in the name of um, uh, universalism. It, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an economic universalism sans frontier. We had our own expression of it in Brexit. In the United States, it's America first. Nationalism is the most vibrant form of politics in Europe today, vibrant form of politics, running from France to Poland. In terms of the curve um, uh, of individualism and collectivism, we're moving along, along towards a toxic form of collectivism which asserts the claims of particular cultural identities against the demands of what Hayek called the great society. Um, in historical terms, the meaning of this uh, today's populist nationalism is rather clear. It's the second coming of fascism. Using the word fascism as a generic semi-criminal political revolt against the norms of decent public life. It doesn't have to, it takes particular forms in different ages. It's always there. And it, it, the reason we don't want to use that word is that in our own minds it's associated with a particular expression of this in the 1920s and 1930s. But of course, you don't have to wear a uniform to be a fascist. The uniform stage of fascism was a direct consequence of the First World War, when the whole of Europe was full of people with uniforms. And, and so it was a militarized, particularly militarized form of, of, of politics. But, but of course, that is, not, that is not generic to fascism. What is generic to fascism is its rhetoric of exaggeration, fake news, and hate rhetoric. And this is the kind of politics that is gaining ground. Now, we can't just say, oh, well, let's fight it in the name of universal values and... Uh, we're all good people. Why? Why has it been gaining ground? We must seriously consider whether the demands of globalization, the project of economic integration heedless of frontiers or populations, hasn't been pressed too far for the human capacity to adapt to those demands. Specifically, are we destined to be slaves to machines? Because often, we're told, well, all this is inevitable, it's irreversible. That is, the te technology is irreversible. Technology drives a lot of uh, globalization. The freedom of capital to move is irreversible. We can't stop it. Production is now irreversible, irreversibly scattered between different locations. We can't in any way do anything about it. We just have to live to it. We just have to adapt to it. And if you don't adapt to it, you're failing uh, and you're irrational and you're stupid. Uh, now, people don't like being told that. And naturally, they, um, they get angry and they um, are quite likely to give support to people who say the opposite. Now, the second challenge is, of course, geopolitical. The shift going on in global power from the United States to China, the second context in which universalism is under challenge. And China isn't simply or even mainly aspiring to take the place of the United States. It doesn't seek a universal hegemony. That is not in. China has never been a universalist power. It doesn't want to make everyone in the world into Chinese, as Americans supposedly have wanted to make everyone into Americans. Uh, it wants the respect which goes with its position and its culture. It wants a multipolar world of which it is one of the poles. And, um, and, and the whole of its economic life is really geared to achieving, to achieving that. So China doesn't represent a new universalism. What we have is a decaying un geopolitical universalism and a wondering what um, is to take its place. Um, now, my last theme, where does Russia fit into this picture of challenges? Well, Russia 
is astride both the challenges to universalism. On the one hand, there are certainly fascistic elements in its economics and politics. When communism fell, the economist joked in 1990, Communi communism is nothing but a detour from capitalism to capitalism. Well, I now tend to view it as a variant of a long-standing Russian uniqueness, which was never capitalist and isn't capitalist today. How to describe an economic system in which the state owns 60 to 70% of the economy, as it now does, without any ideological purpose in that at all? Um, state ownership is a natural consequence, growing state ownership, of the natural resource curse and Russia's failure to develop a diversified economy. Um, so it's not a return to communism, but it's nevertheless a retreat from capitalism. Um, how do we describe this hybrid? Corporatism? Um, something between capitalism and socialism? We don't have a very plausible generalization for this type of system. Our political scientists haven't come up with one, and nor have our economists. But of course, it's not. Um, it, 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 is it a universal model? No. But it's, uh, it, it's a very good description of, 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 of a Rus the Russian economy. And then, what about Putinism? Not exactly dictatorship, not exactly populism, not exactly democracy. What sort of political form, what sort of political animal is this? Is it uniquely a Russian form, or can we find parallels with this in the fascism of Mussolini in, in, in the 1920s, in Francoism, in certain kinds of Latin American populisms? Um, all we still haven't got a generic, a generalization for, for what's, what's happening in Russia. Um, in geopolitical terms, Russia believes in a multipolar world and might hope to use its huge landmass, natural resource base, and still formidable military strength to balance between the West and China with some small, low-risk adventures against its neighbors, which is the Putin style of foreign policy. Well, what I've tried to describe is a world in which universalism, in most of its term forms, is in retreat. What remains of it, and what should we continue to fight for? F first, science and technology is universal. I haven't yet heard of a distinctive Chinese or African science. Perhaps it exists or is in course of invention, but it doesn't actually now exist. So there is a genuinely universal element in science. Its application is a different matter. Second, we all of us share a common fate as a species whose activities uniquely challenge the survival of the planet, our planet, as a source of life. Third, we must continue to insist on the reality and binding character of international law because it's only by respecting the law of nations that the nations of the world can face their common challenges together and peacefully. Otherwise, as the president of the European Council so rightly pointed out, we will take to fighting each other as we have so often in the past. I'm not convinced that um, respect for international law is presupposed on respect for domestic law as we know it. Uh, I mean, there is a connection between the two. It's something we need to talk about. So the School of Civic Education continues to play a vital role in keeping alive the spark of international understanding and enlightenment in a fracturing world. Spasiba.
Спасибо. I would like to thank you and it is my great pleasure to give the floor to somebody who just joined us from Moscow, the ambassador of Germany to the Russian Federation, Mr. Rudziger von Fritsch, a long time long standing friend of this school. Thank you. Sorry for being late and sorry for interrupting somehow, but I have not come to speak in my own function as, as the German ambassador to Russia, but I have the privilege and the honor to relate to you a message sent by Federal President Frank-Walter Steinmeier to this conference and the Civic School of Education. Welcome message from Federal President Frank-Walter Steinmeier. It is with great satisfaction and pleasure that I welcome Lena Nemirovskaya and the School of Civic Education back to Berlin and congratulate them on their 25th anniversary. The universalism that you are pursuing at this conference and in the work of your school has proved elusive and there have been setbacks in the search for it. The temptation to withdraw from global affairs, to see confrontation, to pursue fragmentation and to adopt a parochial approach have grown stronger since I last welcomed you to Berlin two years ago. Many of you live and work under increasingly challenging conditions. But universalism remains an important aspiration and a guiding principle for our thinking and practical work. It is crucial that we have reassessed our own situation and the broader trends of change in our global environment. Some of our assumptions about transformation and the inevitability of convergence after the fall of the Iron Curtain have proven to be too optimistic. It is vital that we remain capable of questioning our own assumptions, adopt to new circumstances and improve our understanding of current developments. Questions and criticism are important, but we should not allow ourselves to be overwhelmed by self-doubt. We need to remain aware of the realities of human nature when we think about our political future on this planet and the aspirations, but there is no reason to give in to despair. The future is less predetermined than some may have hoped two decades ago, but I am fundamentally convinced that our future is open. It is up to us to shape it for the better. Gathering like yours are an opportunity to reflect on where we stand, with some of the best minds and first-hand experience as tools for better understanding. Such gatherings also provide us with an opportunity to reassure one other that none of us is alone in striving to enable the better part of human nature to foster a more peaceful and humane world. I wish you, as always, the right amount of optimism and persistence. Frank-Walter Steinmeier. And allow me to add a few personal remarks without wanting to seem to be wiser than my, my own president. I have been in the foreign service of my country for more than 30 years, starting in the realities of the socialist world as a young diplomat in Poland in the 1980s. And over these last month, I must say, I do feel reminded sometimes of some of the phenomena we witnessed then. And I'm not referring to specifically one country. Many of this does apply also to my own country. And I do not want to draw easy parallels, as sometimes we find in the media, Cold War then, Cold War now. This only blurs, I think, our ability to properly analyze where we stand. But we, what we do witness then and now is a preference given to confrontation over cooperation, to nationalism over reconciliation. And we see that truth is being denied, that values are being slandered, and that those who try to stand tall to defend them are being ridiculed or their lives being rendered difficult. What gave us hope then were those who did stand tall, stand tall. those few, the Michniks and Geremeks, the Mazowieckis and the Wawansas and the Lipskis and the others. And they stood tall against odds and against probabilities because defending 
your convictions, beliefs, and values is not about asking whether it's probable that you'll be, be successful. And few believed they might be successful, but in the end, the few became the many and they prevailed. And that gives us hope today, especially as we have such persons and personalities again. And that is why I would like to thank Lena and Yuri as our, for what, for all you have been doing, for all you have done, you did before, and I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you so much. Okay, I give the floor to Yuri Senakosov. Dear friends, You know, I'm not a poet, but today I'm drawn to poetry. Summer has flown by, the autumn has crawled by, the winter is fluttering like a snowflake butterfly. So for some reason, I feel I would like uh, to see you walking with me along uh, in on a forest road. I know this may sound silly, I may it may sound uh, irrational and may even be selfish, but my darling Lena, could one live without the feeling of life? I suppose you know whom I have sought to address these uh, lines. And the more so that four days uh, ago we celebrated Lena's birthday. But here comes the question. What does this school start with and why does it exist? Certainly it exists uh, through meetings and communication as these make up the fabric of our life. The humanity, the humane part in us is expressed through communication, which cannot be coercive. It must not be born of uh, coercion. Communication presupposes freedom, otherwise uh, we would have uh, no understanding of friendship, trust, uh, or love, these uh, unique values in our life. We can't ban them as we can't ban freedom. They persist because uh, the essence of us as humans is uh, seen and starts from this uh, search of word to express a candid feeling. So any search for the right word may already be considered as a, an invitation to a dialogue. Today, at the time of a global crisis, when there is this great demand for trust and the search for truth, which uh, in the words of Mirab Mamardashvili a philosopher and indeed uh, uh, one of the inspirers, uh, uh, founders indeed of this school. The truth is not based on anything specific, but it brings together and holds together everything else. Let me then uh, remind ourselves of one other concept, that coming from uh, German philosopher Karl Jaspers, which is accent tight the axial time. 
which is uh, the emergence between the 8th and the 2nd uh, centuries BC of, of, uh, uh, of Greek philosophers uh, uh, who uh, speak about, uh, and indeed, uh, the time of the personalistic world religions emanating in India, in the Near East, uh, these teachings of morality in China, this period, Karl Diaspers called the axial time, Axentide, uh, implying that the general history of mankind starts in this uh, time. Why do I remind uh, ourselves uh, of uh, this concept? Because uh, we're talking about the phenomenon of congeniality, about the spiritual uh, being spiritually kindred. The time of uh, very deep and uh, and uh, tense uh, reflection, deliberation, when uh, the mythological worldview was substituted with the rational philosophical worldview. Today we're surviving uh, a time when uh, we are feeling uh, this breach uh, with such. Uh, milestones of uh, axial time as the Renaissance, the Reformation and the Enlightenment or the Age of Reason. Let me quote the report of the uh, Club of Rome which uh, is in, has been entitled uh, Come On! Capitalism demographic challenges and uh, the future of the planet. This uh, has been authored by Ernst von Weizsäcker, um, the member of the Club of Rome and the nephew of the, of the late uh, Bundes uh, president and uh, Richard von Weizsäcker and Anders Weckmann, member of the Swedish uh, parliament. In the uh, annotation to uh, the report um, uh, dedicated to the 50th anniversary of the Club of Rome, it is being said that the uh, developments uh, of the world today are far to be desired and that the admonishments of the Club of Rome um, expressed uh, in the book The Limits to Growth are still relevant. Pope Francis uh, expressed this uh, with great clarity. Our common home is in mortal danger. Through the analysis of this philosophical crisis, uh, a conclusion about the need for a new enlightenment has been, uh, has been made. To achieve this goal, we have uh, to stand clear from isolationism in favor of a more systematic approach, which would require among other things, uh, rethinking of the principles of organization of science and education. However, we have to start and act uh, already now to go back uh, to the path of sustainable uh, devel uh, development. Thence comes the name of this report. Come on. We as school have not agreed with the Club of Rome on on, 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 on the schedule of this forum. But this congeniality with the name uh, of, uh, of uh, the search for universalism is, uh, uh, we're talking about uh, this uh, enlightenment, uh, which we uh, call within this school civic enlightenment. So I shall try to answer the question as to why is it uh, that uh, civic enlightenment and the concept of citizen come to the fore uh, in, uh, at the time of this uh, global uh, crisis. Pope Francis uh, said uh, that our common home, which is inhabited today by over seven and a half billion people, is in mortal danger. The questions are if uh, we're ready, living in this home, uh, are we ready to save it? What infrastructure can we consider to build? What is more important in this common home? Is it the foundation 
the walls, the roof. I remember that several decades before the Soviet Union collapsed, there were two metaphors which uh, seemed to be describing a similar situation. When uh, Brezhnev came to power, it was said, we're all in one boat. And uh, for it to continue right to the seas, we should not swing it. So the Soviet people were supposed to not to swing the boat, not to drown. And the second metaphor, the technical and scientific progress was compared to a big bicycle and we were called to continue rotate the wheels. However, this does not save the country of the so-called developed socialism from breaking up. And the world, the planet of Earth, which in uh, uh, the year 1900 had uh, one and a half billion people, about 1.6 billion people, today we are over 7 billion. How are we to cope with the world with uh, such uh, exponentially growing uh, mutual influence uh, and the influence of the humans on the environment around us? So the depth uh, and the uh, uh, and the sophistication of the problems caused by uh, globalization is ev evident. And indeed, uh, we have to have, among other things, the trust uh, into the principles of the rule of law, democratic governance and the open market. We believe uh, at school that these have to be remembered and they come from Europe, which is uh, our common motherland, uh, the continent uh, which gave rise in the 18th century, uh, the beginning of the um, contemporary process of globalization. I'm talking about Adam Smith's uh, um, famous uh, phrase uh, about uh, the invisible hand of the market, uh, the theory of separation of powers of John Locke and Charles-Louis Montesquieu, and of course, uh, uh, the words of Immanuel Kant, uh, who uh, proclaimed in his uh, treatise, What is Enlightenment, that the public would enlighten itself if only it were allowed the freedom to do so. One may say that these ideas were as a lighthouse of the economic, political and civic development of the European society, which overcame its spiritual immaturity, caused, in the words of Kant, not by the insufficiency of reason, but the lack of dare, mm, the lack of courage to use one's mind independently. So we're talking about this self-made man principle. The aim of enlightenment then is not so much dissemination of knowledge, but development of human mind, or indeed the development of our capacities, of our abilities to use it. So why is it that this enlightened mind became to be so short-sighted and the world today is held hostage uh, uh, by the threatening uh, global problems. One of the reasons is uh, that the creed of uh, uh, the Age of Reason, Sapere Aude, uh, has uh, an inherent uh, paradox and if we deliberate it, then uh, we would uh, find that when we think that uh, we're using some invisible asset and this asset, which is our mind, has been given to us, as Mirab Mardashvili said, as a gift, a gift shared by, by all humans. However, not everybody understands it by burying the talent. And when, uh, uh, however, a man can use this mind, then this human is believed to have the personal talent, uh, which is something that we're seeing uh, as going beyond uh, uh, the phenomenon uh, in ethics and culture. Justice, dignity, honesty, prop personal courage and freedom require personal act, a courage to use and the independent mind to practice uh, the complexity of uh, modern life in democracy, as Lena said.
So indeed, what we need is uh, some infrastructure of the ideal, not so much a technological infrastructure, but uh, uh, indeed uh, an infrastructure of the ideal uh, produced uh, in our mind. When we think about this uh, union of soul and body, which exists uh, in every human being and is expressed de facto, a fact which uh, simply cannot be uh, recreated. We are not in a position to recreate a technologically rational model of this coupling, because uh, this is expressed uh, in every human being on the level of uh, common sense. But what happens if this common sense uh, is uh, supplanted by cynicism and nihilism? The philosophers uh, say that the nature of mind is not a problem of the positive science, of positivism, which is always seeking to have uh, specific results. And the philosophers do emphasize that implementation of thought uh, is uh, uh, related uh, to concentration of the specific intellectual efforts. And there are many of these uh, mysteries, but they all come together in the uh, in this coupling of body and soul. And indeed, the different philosophers that we see, the philosophy of mathematics, uh, the pragmatic philosophy, philosophy of freedom, philosophy of history, epistemology, uh, these are all branches, but indeed of one discipline, which is the love for wisdom, as philosopher was uh, uh, posited by Plato, Descartes and Kant. Mirab Mamardashvili, uh, whom I uh, already mentioned, saw philosophy as an instrument uh, to uh, become a part of the eternal present. A present and a place where uh, we are contemporary with all humans. So the first philosophical step he made is uh, was the utter trust to life. However, making this step uh, was extremely difficult as uh, we uh, uh, tend uh, to counterpoise ourselves with the world. However, if this uh, point uh, of uh, support has been found, then everything uh, comes back into tracks and man regains freedom. At this time, one becomes aware of the chance to meet the other. So I believe uh, that um, people are free to become historians, uh, teacher, politicians, even poets. However, it is not possible to teach somebody to become a philosopher, a poet or a politician. In this case, we are not seeing the world in plural number. We see it in the individual act uh, and uh, indeed the meaning of our school, the birth of those who understand rather than those who are ready to be led by, uh, by a leader without asking questions. Getting back to the common sense is not possible without philosophy. Thank you.